What's up, good movie lovers, and welcome to a movie review for Super 8. There will be spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie yet and have plans to, you might want to turn this off and return after you've checked it out. Overall, it is worthy of big screen viewing at regular price. It's pretty much a complete film in almost every way. It's definitely one of the best films of the year so far. For this blockbuster summer, is right up there with X-Men First Class. Class. Now there's really two avenues I want to travel down for the review here. The first is the fact that this is definitely a huge homage to the Spielberg movies of the 70s and 80s, specifically E.T., The Goonies, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Throw in a little bit of Rob Reiner's Stand By Me and you kind of have the overall spirit that's going on here. The second area to discuss would be the slight lack of adding something new to this and some some character development for the main character Joe Lamb, the 12, 13-ish year old kid that we follow through the little adventure here in the small town. Now I don't want that to sound like a harsh criticism, it's definitely not. This film really takes its time with developing character relationships and is not at all concerned with CGI and the spectacle and the alien and all that. While those elements are in the story, 85% of this is really about the people in the town. It's very much a character-based story that centers around this supernatural extraordinary event of an alien being unleashed when a train derails and I guess it was coming from an Air Force base or possibly Area 51 it's not specifically stated that results in the Army Air Force coming into this town and basically taking it over and lies in deceit and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on while there's this mysterious force lurking about in a very J.J. Abrams blue ball kind away. JJ is the master of just making us wait and wait and wait. Finally get a payoff for all the setups that he constantly does. If you've watched Alias or Lost or Fringe, he is just obsessed with setting up and teasing and making you interested and getting your imagination working until you're finally paid off in the end. And usually the journey of anticipation is much more rewarding than the eventual oh, that's really what it was? Okay. So with that said, I want to start with the journey of the main character here and there's really two images that connect this journey and I want to talk about how in a rewrite it could have been a little bit stronger. This movie opens up in a very Spielbergian kind of way where we get a shot just all visual there's no dialogue communicating any of this information. We see in a factory so many days without an accident and I believe the number is 784 and we see a employee getting those numbers off and putting the number one up. We cut to a little boy sitting on a swing set in his backyard side yard holding a locket a necklace with a picture of a woman and a baby we cut to in the house there's a very somber gathering it's post funeral joe's mom has died in the accident at the factory and we get a shot of a dog so we're getting all these spielbergian archetypes where we have all through the visuals communicated loss something with parents the dog the kid and then this great visual symbol of the necklace and it's the symbol of Joe holding on to the memory of his mother. From that point forward through the film, keeping track of his emotional reactions to this death and of what the locket means to him, it isn't done as powerfully as it could have been. There isn't a scene-to-scene reaction change in Joe that we can pick up on. Joe is very much in the Senor Spielbergo mold of children in his films in the early 80s, which would be the children are smarter, wiser, and more in control of themselves than all the adults that are around them. In The Goonies, you have the adults that are so irresponsible they haven't been able to make payments on the house, and now it's up to the kids to go find a treasure in order to save the house and save their childhood and save their friendships. In E.T., the parents are getting divorced. So Spielberg movies are definitely filled with children who are able to do better than their parents are. Maybe it's the message of don't lose the child within, the wisdom of being young and naive, the simple truth that children don't complicate that adults have to put through this Rube Goldberg machine of it has to be harder than it really is. Truth is simple, and children are not afraid to speak it and follow it and take action based on it. Performances from the children, really well done. The dialogue is well written, and their relationships with each other, really well established. I felt like I was back in grade school, just hanging out with my buddies, and we're just making fun of each other and trying to one-up each other, and this really fun dynamic going on. There's this little side story that all the friends are together 
because they want to make this zombie film. They're kind of amateur filmmakers. Very much like a Dawson's Creek thing going on here. And in Dawson's Creek, Spielberg was a big influence on the title character there. And that really kickstarts how these kids get involved with this alien because they're filming their movie while the train derails. They film some of it. They witness it. Now they have to hide that fact and they have to find out what's going on while the army's there. And then Joe Lamb's father is the sheriff slash deputy and he has to find out what's going on but also deal with his wife's passing. And it's all going to build towards the ending where the alien basically has the same motivation as E.T. but is a lot more pissed off. The naivety, the 1950s aw shucks, aw geez, niceness is gone. This thing's been tortured and experimented on and it's angry. It's kind of insane. It just wanted to go home trying to rebuild its ship which we learn is made up of these Rubik's Cube metal things and once they all come together and I guess they need some sort of uh, natural resource, some steel and metal to make this ship and it wants to punish the humans so it's not afraid to kill people as it's going along gathering everything it needs to rebuild the ship. It doesn't kill everybody though. It kind of captures them and hangs them upside down and drains their blood or uses their energy as a battery kind of as if it was the Matrix. Not really sure about that. It's not spoken which is great because we experience it just like the characters. For the first time we don't know what's going on so there's confusion but we can't extrapolate the story because of the visuals. So it doesn't play down to us. It's not like a lowest common denominator kind of thing. It makes us come up to its levels. The thing with Joe Lamb as the main character that we follow is that I wish he would have been written with more emotional reaction to what goes on because he just has this very stoic zen kind of I'm fine with my mom's death. Life goes on. Accidents happen. You just got to deal with it. And every other character seems to be more emotional than he is. And whether that's because he's hiding it, maybe, but that's never addressed. Here he's the special effects guy, the makeup guy for the filmmaker friends. So that could be a nice little comment that he's good at covering up wounds and hiding his emotions, hiding the truth and making it appear on the surface that everything's fine or that it's different from what's going on beneath the surface. That's okay, I guess. It could work, but again, it wasn't played up. If you're going to make them that, have it be an extension of what's going on on the inside. I would have preferred Joe to be the director of the zombie movie because if he is holding on to his mom so strongly and he won't let go and he's in turmoil, what better metaphor could there be than him wanting to make a story where someone who's dead comes back to life? And being the director would have given him a way to express this rage and frustration. He could have been kind of a jerk to all of his friends. But the way it is, is he's kind of the passive character. So the most interesting character of a movie should be the main character and the opponent, that dynamic between the two. Here the opponent is kind of his dad because he's frustrated and that confused Spielberg kind of adult and he wants him to go to summer camp and not hang out with his friends to make this movie. And then there's his director friend who likes the girl that he's gonna like. His love interest in this film is the daughter of the town drunk, which we learn worked at the factory. He actually was hung over and couldn't make his morning shift and she took his spot and ended up being a victim of an accident. So there's this whole idea of that it should have been this town drunk that was dead and not her. And there's this moment when Joe's love interest, she's in his bedroom and they're watching these Super 8 home movies of Joe and his mom. Kind of throughout the years, it's like this nice montage that takes place over like six years. And it's really touching. It's a beautiful like window character confession cam moment where we see into the emotions of Joe and of what she meant to the family. But the strange thing is that the love interest, she's the one that's crying and sad. And she says, I wish it was my dad and not your mom. And Joe's not affected. And he's just, again, like this Zen wise character. And he says, don't say that. You have to honor your parents. We only get one father, one mother. You have to be thankful for that no matter how and who they are. And it just seems a little bit too wonder kid. It should be that if he's 11, 12, he's still developing emotional intelligence. He's still figuring out how to be in the world. He should be a little bit pissed off and crying and frustrated and sad. The battle between good and good is always more interesting than good and evil. Let's have this very sympathetic and kind love interest be fighting with this main character. Let's have him be a jerk to her. After all, it's her father that he could blame for his mom's death. Let him go through some emotions so that by the end of the film, he's learned to let go, which is really one of the big themes here. The necklace locket comes back into play towards the end. As the alien's building a ship, these cubes are just like magnetizing everything in the town and all the steel and metal is flying towards this water tower where this ship is being reformed. And Joe's locket flies out of his pocket and he grabs it. Watching that in the theater, it was such a powerful moment. It's one of the greatest visuals that I've ever seen in relation to a theme and a character's emotion. It's just this 
beautiful image of literally he has to let his mom's memory go. It's time for him to heal and he's got to let the pain and everything go. Flies up to the water tower, becomes part of the alien ship and the alien takes off and goes into the symbolic heavens and we fade out and it's nice and emotional. Very beautiful, poignant moment. The writing is amazing. The intention is genius. But the effect could have been a little more powerful if Joe had earned it throughout the film. He comes off again as just this wise character that doesn't go through it the emotional ringer scene by scene so when this moment happens there's no true struggle for him to let it go the character that really went through this pain and who should have been holding on to it there would have been the father in that scene who's next to joe he's been the one that's been lashing out and frustrated and not dealing with his emotions he should have been the one to grab it and joe who the way the film is now is the wise sage should have turned to him and said it's time to let her go dad it seems the movie wants joe to be the one that's hung up on the mother memory so the way to do that would be to go back make him more emotionally confused and conflicted lashing out at people and have him heal throughout the film as it goes along the alien seems to be a representation of joe's inner struggle the alien is very much feeling the same way it's been captured there was an accident and he's a victim and now it's blaming everybody and it's just raging out in a lot of ways this alien as a manifestation of joe's inner emotions the way that it does this is kind of in a forbidden planet sort of way where in that film there's the great machine that can read your thoughts and impulses and bring them to life here the alien is joe's pain brought to life and they're going through a similar journey add to that jj abrams gave this alien some sort of telepathic symbiotic power that when it comes into physical contact with anyone it's able to share its emotions and thoughts and memories and also able to read those elements from the person or thing that it's touching. So if JJ creates that, it seems that it's specifically built so that there can be a moment when it comes into contact with the main character and they exchange their pain and they heal each other. I would have gone as far as maybe making Joe and his father both into contact with the alien at the same time and having everybody heal together. Because there's this other brilliant scene where when the alien grabs Joe, they look at each other and they're singing to each other's souls. Joe says, I know, I understand what you're going through, but it was an accident. There can be life after an accident. Just let it go. And it's a beautiful moment. There's so much wisdom in that. But again, it seems a little bit unearned because Joe is just this Zen sage that already understands everything from the beginning of the film. We don't see him go through the emotional turmoil to deserve that kind of wisdom. And that's in movies where a character is going to undergo a journey. Not every movie needs to have that. But if you set up a tragedy at the beginning here and this visual symbol of a locket of holding on to a memory and pain, basically you're saying that you want this character to go through a journey. And the visual at the end indicates that that's the intention, but the conflict, drama, and struggle between those two points wasn't calibrated enough for it to happen on screen. And in a lot of ways, Joe's father carries the emotions that should have been also found in Joe. With that said, this is a million percent success with what its main focus is. And the main focus is the reason why Joe's journey was possibly neglected a little bit. This is Picasso repainting the Mona Lisa, brushstroke for brushstroke, just honoring an influential artist that gave JJ motivation to become a director and a writer. And you could feel Spielberg over his shoulder in some of the shots, whispering in his ear, this is how I would do it. Frame it like this. The score is very John Williams-ish, and there's so many shots in here that remind you of Spielberg films. The tone, the mood, the cinematography is absolutely authentic to the movies back in those days. The storyline, it's a success in that way. We really feel the nostalgia and are taken back one last time. It's like we're leaving our hometown for good and we just want to visit it one more time. And maybe this is a call, a reminder for current filmmakers to look at the movies that inspired generations of audiences and filmmakers to want to make movies and go to the movies and to fall in love with this art form. That the reason these movies work was because of the sense of mystery, the playfulness, the childhood energy of wanting to create something, but also of keeping it emotional and basing it in the characters. Thank you, JJ. Thank you, Steven, for being involved in this film more than you were in the Transformers. Check out the Transformers movie review for thoughts on that. Consider yourselves in the meantime advised for Super 8. Remember that Story Corp always gives us more of what we pay for, so remember, we have to choose our movies wisely. And until next time, long live good movies.